The term Planet X was coined by the American astronomer Percival Lowell sometime between 1905 and 1908. It describes an unobserved planet that perturbs the orbit of a known planet. A perturbation is a deviation in a planet's orbit. And the Planet X we're searching for is Neptune's perturber, which like Neptune, orbits our Sun. For this reason, Planet X is described in ancient wisdom texts and folklore from around the world as Marduk. Frightener, Destroyer, Herkobolus, Nibiru, and more. So is Planet X really nothing more than an internet hoax perpetrated by panic-for-profit fear-mongers as debunkers claim? Or is there more to it than that? There is. And it begins in 18th century Europe. On March 13, 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus, making it the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. Following his discovery, European astronomers turned their attention on Uranus and observed perturbations in its orbit. This discovery would eventually launch the search for Planet X. If one were to choose the father of Planet X research, it would have to be Alexis Bouvard, a French astronomer who observed the perturbations in the orbit of Uranus and attributed them to the existence of an unknown planet, the first Planet X. Unfortunately, Bouvard died before the coordinates for Neptune could be mathematically determined by French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier and British mathematician John Couch Adams using Bouvard's observations. Verrier gets the official credit because he relayed those coordinates to astronomer John Gall of the Berlin Observatory. And five days later, Neptune was observed by Gall on September 23, 1846. This made Neptune the first planet to be discovered by a mathematical prediction. So Neptune was also the first Planet X to be discovered. But subsequent calculations based on the orbits of Uranus and Neptune indicated the presence of yet another Planet X well beyond the orbit of Neptune. And so the search resumed. Not in Europe, but in America. The Lowell Observatory was established in 1894 in Flagstaff, Arizona by Percival Lawrence Lowell, an independent businessman mathematician and astronomer. One reason Lowell founded the observatory was to study the planet Mars and its canals. The other was the search for other objects of interest in our solar system, most particularly Neptune's perturber, Planet X, a fact that revisionist historians downplay or paint over. Yet it was Lowell's intention to find the mysterious Planet X that led to the discovery of Pluto. In 1929, 14 years after Lowell's death, a young astronomer by the name of Clyde W. Tombaugh was retained by the Lowell Observatory to carry on the search for Planet X. And on February 18, 1930, he discovered Pluto. At the time, astronomers believed he had found Planet X, Neptune's perturber. Consequently, the topic of Planet X languished for some time after Tombaugh's discovery. However, after the discovery of Pluto's moon Charon in 1978, it was determined that Pluto lacked the mass to be Neptune's perturber, as it is only about 60% the size of our own moon. So with that, the search for Planet X was once again afoot. It's also interesting to note that Pluto was later demoted to the status of a dwarf planet in 2006 by the International Astronomical Union.
1950, Emanuel Velikovsky published Worlds in Collision, and he was viciously attacked by mainstream science, even though he corresponded frequently with Albert Einstein. What generated this medieval response from modern science is that Velikovsky used ancient accounts to question the Darwinian notion of evolution with evidence of periodic cataclysms caused by large objects flying through the core of our solar system. Despite ruthless suppression, Velikovsky's work reawakened an open discussion of Planet X, and following that, a steady trickle of interest emerged, both in mainstream science and the media. On March 3, 1972, NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft to explore the outer planets. However, according to government whistleblowers, the real purpose was to find Planet X, or at least to help narrow down the search field. An interesting aspect of Pioneer 10 is that it also carried a small gold anodized aluminum plaque designed by astronomer Carl Sagan, should the spacecraft be found by extraterrestrials. At present, communication with the Pioneer 10 spacecraft is no longer possible. Following the launch of Pioneer 10, the topic of Planet X would have languished again had it not been for Zachariah Sitchin, the author of The Twelfth Planet, which was first published in 1976. According to his translations of ancient Sumerian texts, a race of beings living on a planet called Nibiru bioengineered early hominids on Earth to turn them into slaves for the purpose of mining gold. Called the Anunnaki, these beings lived on a planet the Sumerians called Nibiru, what we call Planet X today and the Sumerian accounts tell us that it orbits our Sun every 3600 years and flies through the core of our system, often causing great cataclysms on Earth. Sitchin's translations and theories are corroborated by an ancient wisdom text called the Colburn Bible, and according to Planet X historian Greg Jenner in his book Planet X and the Colburn Bible Connection, previous flybys of this mysterious object caused the sinking of Atlantis, the Deluge, and the Ten Plagues of Exodus. Although Sitchin was continuously mocked and attacked by fundamentalists, our government took his work seriously and on January 25, 1983, NASA launched the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, IRAS. Its mission was to map the sky using infrared. According to NASA, IRAS was unable to complete its mission due to a failure in its supercooling system, and much of the data collected from the probe was classified and has never been disclosed. Several government whistleblowers say that this was a cover-up because NASA shut down IRAS after it imaged Planet X. Their accounts parallel an article published by the New York Times on January 30, 1983, shortly after the IRAS launch. Evidence assembled in recent years has led several groups of astronomers to renew the search for the 10th planet. They are, their accounts parallel an article published by the New York Times on January 30, 1983, shortly after the IRAS launch. Evidence assembled in recent years has led several groups of astronomers to renew the search for the 10th planet. They are devoting more time to visual observations with the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar in California. They are tracking two Pioneer spacecraft, now approaching the orbit of distant Pluto, to see if variations in their trajectories provide clues to the source of the mysterious force. And they are hoping that a satellite-borne telescope launched last week will detect heat signatures from the planet, or whatever it is out there. It is important to note that the term Planet X was also used to refer to a tenth planet. However, after Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet in 2006, that definition became irrelevant. But what is relevant is what IRAS imaged and the consequences of those observations. In a Victoria Advocate article published on June 14, 1988, NASA astronomer Dr. John D. Anderson was quoted as saying that telemetry from the Pioneer 10 spacecraft indicated the existence of Planet X. Also note that this article was sourced from Google News and was featured in Yowza.com's March 2012 article titled The Planet X Cover-Up in the Mainstream Media. Following publication of our article, the entire June 14, 1988 edition was deleted from the Google News site. 
However, a complete copy is available for Yowza.com subscribers. But what is relevant here is that Anderson is a NASA astronomer with one heck of a resume, and what he said in that 1988 news article was powerful. In that article, he said, We have a 90-99% to 99 confidence that Uranus and Neptune are being disturbed, and by one candidate for that is a single Planet X. At that point, our government became more interested in keeping public attention focused much closer to home. After all, if you can't see it, it's not there. So go back to sleep, America. Nothing to see here. However, a few curious minds had other notions. On October 1988, Dr. Robert S. Harrington, the chief astronomer for the U.S. Naval Observatory, published his paper, The Location of Planet X, in the Astronomical Journal. In an August 30, 1990 television interview with Zachariah Sitchin, Harrington also said that Pluto had been a satellite of Neptune, but it was dislodged by Planet X, which he believed could possibly sustain some form of life. He also showed Sitchin a diagram he had created approximating the location of Planet X. Following that interview, Harrington commissioned the construction of a special telescope for a Planet X photographic sky survey in 1991 which was completed at the Black Birch Observatory in New Zealand. The New Zealand observations were performed using Harrington's calculations, and the results were sent to NASA. However, those films vanished and have never been seen again, which leaves us with a big question. Did Harrington actually find Planet X, Neptune's perturber? In 1992, Sitchin produced a documentary titled are we alone in the universe? At the end of that film, Sitchin quotes a NASA press release from that same year. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer body system of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit seven billion miles from the Sun. This NASA press release suggests that Harrington did find Planet X in 1991, but the truth will never be known because before he could publish his findings, Harrington died from a rapid onset of esophageal cancer on January 23, 1993. With his New Zealand findings suppressed and having died before he could publish his findings, many believe he was assassinated. One of the reasons given by those who subscribe to the theory of an assassination was an obituary by Charles E. Worley of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Worley wrote an obituary about Harrington that states, Late in his career, Bob seemed quite skeptical of such an object, however. It is important to note that no other sources have come forward to corroborate Worley's claim. Consequently, Harrington's mysterious death was a shot out of the dark that quickly silenced the Planet X topic, both with the mainstream media and science community alike. In a very real sense, it was a veiled threat. Tamper with this at the risk of your own career, or perhaps even your life. In this regard, Worley's obituary was highly effective. This is for sure. Nonetheless, there is a curious question. Harrington built a custom telescope for a U.S. Naval Observatory station in New Zealand. The mission was simple, to find Planet X. So then, did they? Who knows? Because until NASA decides to declassify Harrington's observations, all we can say is that where there is smoke, there is fire. Meanwhile, we're not helpless either, and you'll see why later on in this program. But for now, if you are beginning to feel that the time has come to begin your own planning and preparation for whatever may come, then know this. When the worst of it hits, it will not be brief. This will not be weeks or months. Rather, we're looking at several years, perhaps longer than a decade. What this means is that your supplies, no matter how much you have on hand, is nothing more than a buffer. It buys you some time to work something else out. To optimize that opportunity of time, gather knowledge now. Because after things run out, knowledge will help you to endure. And now, I'd like to share some of this very knowledge with you. It's something I've put a lot of work and love into because I know it will help people to make it to the backside. And that is what I'm all about. For those in preparation and planning, 
Healthcare is always a problematic area because it is focused on the pills, potions, and supplements preppers set aside to help get themselves through a cataclysm. And it is problematic because all things physical play out. So a practical solution is what we call transition planning. So is this a December 21, 2012 solution? No. In our last video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Path Analysis, we addressed December 21, 2012 as an awareness event. It was media driven and it was successful in creating awareness. So on that regard, mission accomplished. Now, transition is the mission. Simply put, surviving the worst of times begins with surviving the best of times. So in this program, we want to introduce the core concept of transition planning. It is a four-stage survival resource rating system. Stage one is cataclysm awareness. This is when the mainstream media begins to seriously report the news to the public at large and panic buying ensues. If you're not prepared by this time, be ready for long lines and short supplies at the store. Stage two is cataclysm events. Simply put, the first to fall will most likely be the last to know. Planning and luck will also play equal roles. While planning and preparation is not a guarantee that you and your loved ones will survive these events, it will, however, dramatically increase your odds of survival. And with repeated events, expect all or part of your survival stores or caches to be exhausted, lost, or stolen. Stage 3 is post-event. Those who survive the cataclysm event will search for survivors and pull together into small, self-organized groups. While most preppers set aside enough for themselves and their loved ones, as a member of a larger survival group, you'll also share with them as well. This is when the bulk of your physical supplies will be used up. Stage 4 is the backside. This will be the time years into the future when those who survive all the worst that men and nature can throw at them live to see blue skies once again. By this time, all medical supplies will have long been exhausted, and what you'll have is knowledge. Of paramount importance will be the kind of knowledge that helps you with survival wellness and developing sustainable ways of growing food and medicinal herbs. This brings us to the simple metric of our transition planning system. It's a rating system. You rate your resources, physical and knowledge, in terms of how far they'll get you through the process. Here are a few examples. The internet is a fabulous stage one resource, but it likely will not go much further than that. A fire extinguisher is a handy stage two resource. Have one on hand. And off-road bicycles will be an ideal stage three resource for getting around when there's not much left in the way of roads. And long after the internet, fire extinguishers and off-road bicycles have rusted away, knowledge will continue to endure, especially survival knowledge like Danjun breathing. Danjun breathing was created by Korean ruling elites back in the early days of acupuncture. These people were not worried about dying from hunger or thirst. Rather, they lived in fear of catching a cold, hence the old expression, don't catch your death of cold. And to explain how it works, is Dungeon Breathing for Wellness co-developer, Master Roar Shepherd. You want to have a tool that's been used for thousands of years to deal with these kind of situations. Dungeon Breathing is easy to learn, quickly oxidizes the body, lets go of carbon dioxide waste, and lowers the calorie demand of the body. More oxidation in the body, less influence from communicable diseases. Now that's important. The complete Donjon Breathing for Wellness system from feelbetteronyourown.com includes a full-color symptoms handbook and six exercise and reference DVDs. This course was developed by preppers, for preppers, and the symptoms handbook is the core of the system. It offers quick access to poses for a wide range of symptoms and complaints. And it's designed to help volunteer trainers pass along these simple techniques to others. Each pose is cross-referenced by skill level, symptom, and personal goals. Organized into three levels, low impact, universal, and high impact, the 57 core poses offered in the Feel Better on Your Own system represent those used by Korean elites for centuries. They are simple, practical, and highly effective. To learn more, visit feelbetteronyourown.com today and view our free instruction videos.
Imagine that you knew about the stock market crash of 1929 well in advance of the common man. Obviously, you could use such advanced knowledge to reap windfall profits from the misery. That is, assuming you were to keep the knowledge a secret. So, to what lengths would you go to keep future victims in the dark so that you could achieve the full measure of your own self-interested goals? Likewise, would you expect elites to rise above their own compulsions for power and wealth for moral or ethical purposes to inform the public at large, even if you are not so inclined? The point here is that for the elites, the topic of Planet X has always been about the leverage of deception because of something I call Titanic rules. First class gets the boats and steerage goes down with the ship. We're steerage and the best we can do is to muster an occasional glimpse through a foggy porthole before the elites close it. Yes, it's unfair, but it has always been that way and each day you spend agonizing over this is one less day you're focused on what really matters, your survival and that of those for whom you love and care. Keep this in mind as we present excerpts from observation reports. On April 24, 2006, Yowza.com broke the story on the South Pole Telescope, SPT, in Antarctica. The stated mission for the SPT really doesn't make a lot of sense because the same science could be done somewhere else at a fraction of the cost. So why build an expensive and sophisticated infrared telescope in such an inhospitable and inaccessible location as the Adamson Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica? The answer is simple. This infrared 10-meter dish is the perfect instrument for observing an object rising up through the southern skies in infrared. And once they turned it on in January 2007, that's exactly what happened. A year after the SPT went online, the first of three highly credible disclosure videos were published on YouTube. The first, posted by Nibiru Shock 2012, was titled Nibiru Planet X Photos Taken January 2008. It was the first time the public had an opportunity to see an image of Planet X in deep space. And here you see a capture from the video, and the same capture again, but enhanced. In it, we see not just one object, but several. This is when we first learned that Planet X is actually a mini constellation of planets and moons orbiting a small brown dwarf star that is the binary twin to our own Sun. Those of you who were in high school and college during the 1970s may remember this second Sun as Nemesis, the designation used by professional astronomers of the day to discuss the possibility that we live in a binary star system. Also, just as Sitchin and Harrington predicted, it would be rising up from the southern skies. But we wondered, could lightning strike twice with another disclosure video? On March 3, 2008, Nibiru Shock posted his second video titled Nibiru Planet X Update February 1, 2008. What do you know, lightning did strike twice. And in that video we're told that Nibiru is now inside the Kuiper Belt, well beyond the orbit of Pluto. In this video, he tells us it is entering our system at an extremely shallow angle. This is consistent with our most current findings. In this second video, Nibiru Shock 2012 gave us a brilliant series of images that clearly show Planet X is a rather substantial mini constellation of planets and moons, a brown dwarf star that is in turn orbiting our own Sun. Consequently, it does not look or move like anything humans have seen in over 3,600 years. He also told us that governments are afraid of a panic. Perhaps. But then again, remember Titanic rules. First class gets the boats, and steerage goes down with the ship. We're steerage. Why do we say this? Because after these two videos were posted, the Nibiru Shock 2012 channel was hijacked by disinformationalists, and the first two videos were labeled a hoax and the channel was also corrupted. Having investigated the first two Nibiru Shock 2012 videos at length, we published our findings on April 6, 2008, in an article titled, First Two Planet X SPT Leaked Image Videos by Nibiru Shock 2012, now seen as highly credible. The reason we drew this conclusion was that these were very impressive disclosures, but the manner in which the channel was attacked showed clear evidence of a well-organized and well-funded use of disinformation tradecraft. Following publication of our report, 
Yowza.com came under heavy attack. Our site was hacked, and a slander campaign was leveled against us with brutal vitriol. In the process of defending ourselves, we filed DMCA complaints with YouTube, and to their credit, Google removed over 13 different attack videos and terminated four disinformation channel accounts. Then on May 29, 2008, we published an update article titled Planet X Nibiru SPT Disclosures May 2008 Report. In it, we presented our analysis of a third SPT disclosure video by a different YouTuber going by the name of DNIR4808N. This YouTuber described how a personal friend working at the SPT had sent him an image of the Planet X system captured by the SPT on May 14, 2008. In the video, DNIR4808N named his friend, and the government had the YouTube channel removed along with this video within a few hours after it was posted. Thanks to an anonymous tip, we were able to download the video before the channel disappeared. The video was authentic, but the manner in which the channel was taken down was clear proof of further government suppression. And when you compare the images in the DNIR4808N video with the Nibiru Shock 2012 videos, it's obvious that both are of the same object or series of objects, which also happen to be in the southern skies. At that point, the question for our team was simple. How did these three SPT disclosure videos compare with Dr. Harrington's paper, The Location of Planet X, published in October 1988, and with the illustration he showed Zachariah Sitchin in a 1990 television interview? Luckily for us, the answer came a few months later. Corroboration for Harrington's calculations finally came in 2008 with the last polar flyby of the Sun by the ESA NASA Ulysses probe. Although NASA says that the spacecraft failed before critical data could be gathered in its last orbit around the southern hemisphere of our Sun, it nonetheless yielded valuable data, and we published that on October 13, 2008 with an article titled The ESA NASA Ulysses Probe and Planet X Nibiru. The probe data is clear. The Sun's southern hemisphere is noticeably more active than its northern hemisphere. Also of interest is where the peak solar winds originate and the direction in which they're pointed. Our team continued researching Harrington's paper and the many disclosure videos we'd seen. Finally, on September 7, 2010, we published our findings in an article with a video titled The Only Three Authentic SPT Disclosure Videos of 2008. Simply put, the three videos we discussed in this program by Nibiru Shock 2012 and DNIR 4808N are the real deal. What wasn't a real deal as predictions go was Comet Elenin. And we first raised that question in an article we published on May 15, 2011, titled, Is Comet Elenin a Decoy? After a lot of speculation, the result here is that sometimes a comet is just a comet. However, Comet Elenin was a ripe opportunity for organized distraction. Consequently, it was portrayed as Planet X, the nemesis dark star astronomers debated in the 70s, the star of Bethlehem to herald the second coming, and an alien mothership under intelligent control. As it turns out, the only thing under intelligent control was the disinformation. So the next time you see a stampede in progress, you might want to keep this in mind. On July 30, 2012, a YouTube channel of anonymous amateur astronomers the Zero Zero Sky View posted a video titled What Begins in Aquarius Ends in Aquarius. One of the first things we noticed was that this group of folks were showing us their instrumentation. Now that was something new. Then they showed us where they found their object of interest, four degrees below the ecliptic. Plus, like the SPT disclosure videos, this group is showing us images of a mini constellation with a large object in the center and a cluster of satellites in orbit around it. But what really got our attention was that they were observing a red iron dust cloud, the hallmark signature of a brown dwarf star. Then on November 1, 2012, the Zero Zero Skyview team upped the ante with a video titled Lifting the Veil. 
right out the gate, they predicted a greatest eastern elongation flyby approaching from the southern skies. Not a good thing. In astronomy, a greatest eastern elongation describes an object that passes us on our side of the sun to the left of us and inside our own orbit. In this case, this object is also rising up from our southern skies. And it's interesting to compare the ESA NASA Ulysses probe data with the 00 Skyview flyby prediction. They then presented an orbit for their object of interest, which also happens to resemble the orbit Dr. Robert S. Harrington showed in August 30, 1990, during a television interview with Zachariah Sitchin. Next, the 00 Skyview team presented a series of color shifted variations and a wide field view. However, their last image is of a mini constellation in Aquarius and it is similar to the mini constellation in the January 2008 disclosure video by Nibiru Shock 2012 titled Nibiru Planet X Photos taken January 2008. So were they seeing the same thing? Well, we must wait and watch because this mini constellation moves through the sky like nothing we've ever seen before. However, what we can say is that when it does appear for all to see, it will appear suddenly. And given the observations for 2013 you're about to see, the need to plan and prepare for whatever may come is more important than ever before. But first we want to acknowledge you ladies out there who've taken an interest in Planet X. When we published our first article in January 2002 on Planet X, women represented a 12% audience share. But in 2013 your ranks have grown to nearly three times that. Thank you intrepid ladies out there because, well, the topic of Planet X is no longer a boys club. With this in mind, I want to share helpful survival knowledge about dealing with a very ancient curse, both today and long after your medical kit is empty. Every self-healing energy art is about drawing energy and oxygen into the body. But only Danjun breathing focuses on an area of the body women know as the womb, below the belly button and above the pelvis. It is why Danjun breathing is so effective in helping to relieve the symptoms of menopause and PMS, as Master Roar Shepherd explains. We energize that area, we heal that area, we bring oxygen right into that area. More oxygen, more healing, less pain. This is the most valuable tool for you. Ladies, when drugs and treatments are no longer available and the medical kits are empty, what can you do? You do what Korean women have done for thousands of years, because it works. Don Jun breathing. Need relief today? The good news is, the sooner you start, the better. To learn more, visit feelbetteronyourown.com today and view our free instruction videos. At the beginning of January 2013, Yowza.com researchers began tracking an uncatalogued object using the Vulcan feed camera from the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica. I dubbed the object Blue Bonnet. With these observations, we began to see a pattern forming in terms of Planet X being a mini constellation instead of a single object. Though Blue Bonnet is clearly not a brown dwarf companion to our own sun, its movement through the sky does raise the possibility that it could be a far-flung orbital of a second sun. On February 11, 2013, we published our findings in a video titled Object of Interest as Seen from the Turrialba Volcano. In this frame, you see Blue Bonnet above the Turrialba Volcano and specification data for the Vulcan feed. Turrialba is 10 degrees north of the equator at approximately 11,000 feet, and the Vulcan camera was pointed to the southwest with a good view of the Pacific Ocean on a clear day. In that video, we explain the difference between the horizon as we see it here on Earth and represented by the red line. The green line you see cutting through the center of the Sun is the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the plane of our solar system, and all of the planets orbit the Sun within a few degrees of it. This is important to know when analyzing a newly revealed and disturbing prediction by Nostradamus. In October 2007, the History Channel aired The Lost Book of Nostradamus for the first time. 
In this video, seven prophetic images paint a catastrophic end to life as we know it. According to this program, Nostradamus is showing us the constellation of Fucus because it will play a pivotal role in the flyby. This was interesting because the Vulcan feed image data also shows Blue Bonnet transiting through or very near to the constellations Ophiuchus and Sagittarius in December of last year. Then on April 20th, 2013, we released an update video titled Blue Kachina and its Moon for our Turialba object of interest. In doing our research, we began developing a new technique to analyze the imaging capabilities of the Vulcan feed camera at Turialba. We initially used this technique in a rather limited way, but it later evolved into a powerful image analysis method. Also noted in this update was a video released by the 00 Skyview team on March 23, 2013, titled The Five Uploaded Images from the Dance of the Stars video. In that video, they provided a chart that gave us an interesting possibility for potential orbitals in the vicinity of Ophiuchus. Following months of observations and capturing hundreds of images to our database, we were able to plot a rough orbit for Blue Bonnet, which we determined to be an, an outermost orbital of the Planet X system Brown Dwarf companion to our own Sun. Ergo, Blue Bonnet does not orbit our Sun, but rather something else that does. We also looked at the predictions of remote viewer Major Ed Dames about these times and what the Colburn Bible tells us to expect. The first passage of Manuscripts 3-4 begins with, When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. This is a key passage, so let's take a moment to study it. When blood drops upon the earth refers to the iron dust cloud surrounding the Planet X system. The destroyer will appear. What this tells us is that the iron dust cloud precedes the arrival of the destroyer which in this case is Planet X, the ancient Hebrew and Egyptian description for this mini-constellation. And the rest just doesn't get any better. On July 8, 2013, the 00 Skyview team posted a new video titled Fire in the Sky Part 3. The term KBO stands for Kuiper Belt Object, which is a classification for Planet X. Potential orbitals refers to the planets and moons in orbit around the KBO. And here they finally ask the question, is this our binary star? The reason they posted that question to the viewer is because they've observed a large nucleus for the KBO. But it was their second video on the 12th of that month titled A Cyclical Storm Brews that really got our attention. Near the end of the video, they announced that they followed our Turialba volcano research and the object I dubbed Blue Bonnet. We then get a warm attaboy from the good folks at the 00 Skyview. Thank you, fellas. Your kind words of support were greatly appreciated, and we certainly hope to see you on the backside. Because you corroborated our observations of Blue Bonnet, we were able to take a big step forward. On July 28, 2013, we posted our video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Analysis, with featured observer Jorge Arena. Early on, an old debunking attack that Blue Bonnet is a reflection because it appears in front of the sun was disproved with a series of Vulcan feed captures. The series clearly shows Blue Bonnet slipping behind the clouds. Also, the image analysis method we first introduced to our viewers in April was formalized and presented in detail. We call it Camera Sensor Illumination, CSI, and we used it to compare two Blue Bonnet captures from this year one from January and the other from May. Our CSI analysis shows that Blue Bonnet has been growing larger and brighter. Likewise, CSI was used to evaluate the observation images of Jorge Arena. He is an importer of Peruvian foods and herbals and he's based in Ontario, Canada. On May 27, 2013, while flying over the Eastern Pacific, he imaged the brown dwarf at the core of the Planet X system. While it appears at the Sun's 11 o'clock position relative to Earth's horizon, the actual placement relative to the ecliptic is below the ecliptic and near the Sun's 8 o'clock position. Also note that the Volcan feed in Costa Rica is pointed towards the southwest at an elevation of approximately 11,000 feet, and that when Jorge took his picture, 
He was at 37,000 feet, and his camera was also pointed towards the southwest. And once again, we find an interesting connection between Jorge's observation and the 2008 ESA NASA Ulysses probe data presented earlier. Using the data available on Bluebonnet plus Jorge's images, we were able to approximate the orbit of the Planet X mini constellation through the core of our solar system. What this corroborates is the prediction of the 00 Skyview team that the Planet X flyby would happen on our side of the Sun in their November 1st, 2012 video titled Lifting the Veil. Further to that, in a September 2008 interview with Kerry Cassidy of Project Camelot, government whistleblower Bob Dean predicted the very same thing, that the Planet X flyby will occur when it is on our side of the Sun. And now, a moment of truth. Everything you've seen up to this point is intelligence. That is, a connected collection of fragments and shards of truth that happened to slip past years of suppression. But for those of you who insist on smoking gun proof, you're not going to believe anything until you've seen it yourself. That begs the question, what can you see today? What you can see are a lot of rocks coming our way. The American Meteor Society was founded in 1911 for meteor observations. It is a reliable source for information about meteors and fireballs. If you need to see things for yourself, visit www.amsmeteors.org and support the effort. But why would you want to do that? Because on February 15, 2013, NASA had all of us focused on the flyby of asteroid 2012 DA-14. After weeks of media hype, the flyby turned out to be a rather boring non-event. Yet, yeah, on the very same day, the Chelyablinsk meteor airbursted over the southern Urals. It was the largest rock to hit our planet in over a century, and its detonation released the equivalent energy of over 20 Hiroshima bombs. It damaged over 7,000 buildings, and 500 people had to seek medical treatment for wounds. When pressed by the media for an explanation as to why NASA never saw it coming, they finally had to admit that they were blindsided by this meteor because it came out of the sun and that they do not have any telescopes pointed in that direction. Still the same, can you imagine the carnage that would have occurred had this meteor airbursted over a major American city with the equivalent energy of over 20 Hiroshima atomic bombs? The point here is that we can continue to argue about what is happening here on Earth in a way that keeps the consensus out of reach. But when it comes to meteors, there are no more frivolous debunker theories about natural variation, increased reporting, and, well, swamp gas. Just consequences. That is why visiting the American Meteor Society, the AMS, is something you can do today to see what's coming at us. To show you why, we're going to show what people are seeing and reporting from 2010 through October 2013 based on AMS observation reporting data. Next you will see our statistical analysis for the following fireball observation trends. The average number of reports per event, number of reports by classification, multi-state event observations, fragmentation observations, events with sound reports, and finally a comparative trend summary that ties it all together. So let's begin. This series of slides shows the overall growth in the average number of reports per event for all classifications from January 1, 2010 to October 13, 2013. Of note is that in 2013, we see for the very first time in the history of AMS two fireball observations with over 1,000 reports each. So let's take a closer look at those reporting classifications. The AMS classifies meteor observations based on the number of reports per incident, where a mid-sized class event has 6 to 20 reports, a significant event has 21 to 50 reports, a large event has 51 to 100 reports, and a huge event has over 100 reports. So let's begin with a look at the mid-sized events. Here we see a pronounced jump from 2010 to 2011. Part of that jump can be attributed to the implementation of new reporting procedures by the AMS. Now let's add the number of significant reports with 21 to 50 observations each. 
here we see a clear growth trend. Interestingly enough, there were no significant large events in 2010, but there were significant large events in 2011 and 2012, as well as a marked increase in 2013. In terms of huge events with over 100 reports, 2010 was barely noticeable. However, that picks up in 2011 and doubles in 2012, and then again in 2013. Given that we had two events with more than 1,000 observations in 2013, let's take a closer look at the uptick in huge events. Here we see the jump from 2011 to 2012, and then again to 2013, is stunning to say the least. Not only is the trend huge, so are the fireballs or bolides as they are also called. So what's driving this trend? Multi-state observations. A multi-state event is where observations of the same fireball are reported in two or more states. And here we see a steady growth trend from 2010 to 2013. However, this underplays an even more profound change. Here we see a 15% increase from 2010 to 2013 in the number of reporting states by event. This clearly shows that these fireballs, or bolides if you will, are getting bigger. And another measure of this is fragmentation. Fragmentation is a key indicator of size. And while angle of attack and velocity also play a factor, the rule of thumb is the larger the meteor, the more likely it is to fragment, or break apart if you will. From 2011 through 2013, the number of meteors large enough to fragment skyrocketed according to AMS reporting data. This should be of real concern to all of us, because this represents a 400% increase in just three years, and because there is a corresponding increase in sound as well. The AMS tracks two kinds of sounds. Concurrent sounds heard during the flyby, and delayed sounds heard just afterwards. These charts are a combination of both, and the trend is clear. Sound follows with fragmentation. And what is really striking is that sound and fragmentation reports for 2010 through 2013 show nearly identical increases. So now let's summarize what we've seen so far by looking at the growth trend percentages from 2010 to 2013. Now let's look at a big picture view of the AMS data based on the average number of observation reports per event, events with sound reports, fragmentation observations, and multi-state event observations. And what we see here beginning with 2010 is a consistent growth trend by percentage from 2010 through to 2013. It is important to note that all of the data presented in this video is for the 2013 reporting period of January 1, 2013 to October 13, 2013, with two and a half months yet to be reported. And for those of you who are still laboring with doubts about all of this, there is only one question you need to answer. What's throwing all these rocks at us? And what about those of you who no longer have any doubts about the need to plan and prepare for whatever may come? Do not plan against what you fear but for what you love, because survival is not about holding on to things. It's about holding on to each other. For the Yowza.com and PlanetXTownHall.com research team, this is Marshall, and we'll catch you on the backside. At the beginning of January 2013, Yelza.com researchers began tracking an uncatalogued object using the Vulcan feed camera from the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica. I dubbed the object Blue Bonnet. With these observations, we began to see a pattern forming in terms of Planet X being a mini constellation instead of a single object. Though Blue Bonnet is clearly not a brown dwarf companion to our own sun, its movement through the sky does raise the possibility that it could be a far-flung orbital of a second sun. On February 11, 2013, we published our findings in a video titled Object of Interest as Seen from the Turrialba Volcano. In this frame, you see Blue Bonnet above the Turrialba Volcano and specification data for the Vulcan feed. 
Turrialba is 10 degrees north of the equator at approximately 11,000 feet, and the Volcan camera was pointed to the southwest with a good view of the Pacific Ocean on a clear day. In that video, we explain the difference between the horizon as we see it here on Earth and represented by the red line. The green line you see cutting through the center of the Sun is the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the plane of our soul, and finally, a comparative trend summary that ties it all together. So let's begin. This series of slides shows the overall growth in the average number of reports per event for all classifications from January 1, 2010 to October 13, 2013. Of note is that in 2013, we see for the very first time in the history of AMS two fireball observations with over 1,000 reports each. So let's take a closer look at those reporting classifications. The AMS classifies meteor observations based on the number of reports per incident, where a mid-sized class event has 6 to 20 reports, a significant event has 21 to 50 reports, a large event has 51 to 100 reports, and a huge event has over 100 reports. So let's begin with a look at the mid-sized events. Here we see a pronounced jump from 2010 to 2011. Part of that jump can be attributed to the implementation of new reporting procedures by the AMS. Now let's add the number of significant reports with 21 to 50 observations each. Here we see a clear growth trend. Interestingly enough, there were no significant large events in 2010, but there were significant large events in 2011 and 2012, as well as a marked increase in 2013. It is to fragment, or break apart if you will. From 2011 through 2013, the number of meteors large enough to fragment skyrocketed according to AMS reporting data. This should be of real concern to all of us because this represents a 400% increase in just three years and because there is a corresponding increase in sound as well. The AMS tracks two kinds of sounds. Concurrent sounds heard during the flyby and delayed sounds heard just afterwards. These charts are a combination of both, and the trend is clear. Sound follows with fragmentation. And what is really striking is that sound and fragmentation reports for 2010 through 2013 show nearly identical increases. So now let's summarize what we've seen so far by looking at the growth trend percentages from 2010 to 2013. Now let's look at a big picture view of the AMS data based on the average number of observation reports per event, events with sound reports, fragmentation observations, and multi-state event observations. And what we see here beginning with 2010 is a consistent growth trend by percentage from 2010 through to 2013. It is important to note that all of the data presented in this video is for the 2013 reporting period of... In 1992, Sitchin produced a documentary titled, Are We Alone in the Universe? At the end of that film, Sitchin quotes a NASA press release from that same year. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer body system of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit seven billion miles from the Sun. This NASA press release suggests that Harrington did find Planet X in 1991. But the truth will never be known, because before he could publish his findings, Harrington died from a rapid onset of esophageal cancer on January 23, 1993. With his New Zealand findings suppressed and having died before he could publish his findings, many believe he was assassinated. One of the reasons given by those who subscribe to the theory of an assassination was an obituary by Charles E. Worley of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Worley wrote an obituary about Harrington that states, Late in his career, Bob seemed quite skeptical of such an object, however. It is important to note that no other sources have come forward to corroborate Worley's claim. Consequently, Harrington's mysterious death was a shot out of the dark that quickly silenced the Planet X topic both with the mainstream media and science community alike. In a very real sense, it was a veiled threat. 
At the end of that film, Sitchin quotes a NASA press release from that same year. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer body system of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit seven billion miles from the Sun. This NASA press release suggests that Harrington did find Planet X in 1991, but the truth will never be known because before he could publish his findings, Harrington died from a rapid onset of esophageal cancer on January 23, 1993. With his New Zealand findings suppressed and having died before he could publish his findings, many believe he was assassinated. One of the reasons given by those who subscribe to the theory of an assassination was an obituary by Charles E. Worley of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Worley wrote an obituary about Harrington that states, Late in his career, Bob seemed quite skeptical of such an object, however. It is important to note that no other sources have come forward to corroborate Worley's claim. Consequently, Harrington's mysterious death was a shot out of the dark that quickly silenced the Planet X topic, both with the mainstream media and science community alike. In a very real sense, it was a veiled threat. Tamper with this at the risk of your own career, or perhaps even your life. In this regard, Worley's obituary, it's something I've put a lot of work and love into because I know it will help people to make it to the backside. And that is what I'm all about. For those in preparation and planning, healthcare is always a problematic area because it is focused on the pills, potions, and supplements preppers set aside to help get themselves through a cataclysm. And it is problematic because all things physical play out. So a practical solution is what we call transition planning. So is this a December 21, 2012 solution? No. In our last video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Path Analysis, we addressed December 21, 2012 as an awareness event. It was media driven and it was successful in creating awareness. So on that regard, mission accomplished. Now transition is the mission. Simply put, surviving the worst of times begins with surviving the best of times. So in this program, we want to introduce the core concept of transition planning. It is a four-stage survival resource rating system. Stage one is cataclysm awareness. This is when the mainstream media begins to seriously report the news to the public at large and panic buying ensues. If you're not prepared by this time, be ready for long lines and short supplies at the store. Stage two is cataclysm of the Planet X system. The destroyer will appear. What this tells us is that the iron dust cloud precedes the arrival of the destroyer, which in this case is Planet X, the ancient Hebrew and Egyptian description for this mini constellation. And the rest just doesn't get any better. On July 8, 2013, the 00 Skyview team posted a new video titled Fire in the Sky Part 3. The term KBO stands for Kuiper Belt Object, which is a classification for Planet X. Potential orbitals refers to the planets and moons in orbit around the KBO. And here they finally ask the question, is this our binary star? The reason they posted that question to the viewer is because they've observed a large nucleus for the KBO. But it was their second video on the 12th of that month titled A Cyclical Storm Bruise that really got our attention. Near the end of the video, they announced that they followed our Turrialba volcano research and the object I dubbed Blue Bonnet. We then get a warm attaboy from the good folks at the 00 Skyview. Thank you, fellas. Your kind words of support were greatly appreciated, and we certainly hope to see you on the backside. Because you corroborated our observations of Blue Bonnet, we were able to take a big step forward. On July 28, 2013, troops, while most preppers set aside enough for themselves and their loved ones, as a member of a larger survival group, you'll also share with them as well. This is when the bulk of your physical supplies will be used up. Stage four is the backside. This will be the time years into the future when those who survive all the worst that men and nature can throw at them live to see blue skies once again. By this time, all medical supplies will have long been exhausted, and what you'll have is knowledge. 
of paramount importance will be the kind of knowledge that helps you with survival wellness and developing sustainable ways of growing food and medicinal herbs. This brings us to the simple metric of our transition planning system. It's a rating system. You rate your resources, physical and knowledge, in terms of how far they'll get you through the process. Here are a few examples. The internet is a fabulous stage one resource, but it likely will not go much further than that. A fire extinguisher is a handy stage two resource. Have one on hand. And off-road bicycles will be an ideal stage three resource for getting around when there's not much left in the way of roads. And long after the internet, fire extinguishers and off-road bicycles have rusted away, knowledge will continue to endure, especially survival knowledge like Danjun breathing. Danjun breathing was created by Korean ruling elites. Backup ones will survive these events. It will, however, dramatically increase your odds of survival. And with repeated events, expect all or part of your survival stores or caches to be exhausted, lost, or stolen. Stage 3 is post-event. Those who survive the cataclysm event will search for survivors and pull together into small, self-organized groups. While most preppers set aside enough for themselves and their loved ones, as a member of a larger survival group, you'll also share with them as well. This is when the bulk of your physical supplies will be used up. Stage 4 is the backside. This will be the time years into the future when those who survive all the worst that men and nature can throw at them live to see blue skies once again. By this time, all medical supplies will have long been exhausted, and what you'll have is knowledge. Of paramount importance will be the kind of knowledge that helps you with survival wellness and developing sustainable ways of growing food and medicinal herbs. This brings us to the simple metric of our transition planning system. It's a rating system. You rate your resources, physical and knowledge, in terms of how far they'll get you through the process. Here are a few examples. The internet is a fabulous stage one resource, but it likely will not go much further than that. A fire extinguisher is a handy stage two resource. Have one on hand. By preppers, for preppers, and the symptoms handbook is the core of the system. It offers quick access to poses for a wide range of symptoms and complaints. And it's designed to help volunteer trainers pass along these simple techniques to others. Each pose is cross-referenced by skill level, symptom, and personal goals. Organized into three levels, low impact, universal, and high impact, the 57 core poses offered in the Feel Better on Your Own system represent those used by Korean elites for centuries. They are simple practical and highly effective. To learn more, visit feelbetteronyourown.com today and view our free instruction videos. Imagine that you knew about the stock market crash of 1929 well in advance of the common man. Obviously, you could use such advanced knowledge to reap windfall profits from the misery. That is, assuming you were to keep the knowledge a secret. So, to what lengths would you go to keep future victims in the dark so that you could achieve the full measure of your own self-interested goals? Likewise, would you expect elites to rise above their own compulsions for power and wealth for moral or ethical purposes to inform the public at large, even if you are not so inclined? or perhaps even your life. In this regard, Worley's obituary was highly effective. This is for sure. Nonetheless, there is a curious question. Harrington built a custom telescope for a U.S. Naval Observatory station in New Zealand. The mission was simple, to find Planet X. So then, did they? Who knows? Because until NASA decides to declassify Harrington's observations, all we can say is that where there is smoke, there is fire. Meanwhile, we're not helpless either, and you'll see why later on in this program. But for now, if you are beginning to feel that the time has come to begin your own planning and preparation for whatever may come, then know this. When the worst of it hits, it will not be brief. This will not be weeks or months. Rather, we're looking at several years, perhaps longer than a decade. 
What this means is that your supplies, no matter how much you have on hand, is nothing more than a buffer. It buys you some time to work something else out. To optimize that opportunity of time, gather knowledge now, because after things run out, knowledge will help you to endure. And now, I'd like to share some of this very knowledge with you. It's something I've put a lot of work and love into because I know it will help people to make it to the backside. And that is what I'm all about. By the American astronomer Percival Lowell, sometime between 1905 and 1908. It describes an unobserved planet that perturbs the orbit of a known planet. A perturbation is a deviation in a planet's orbit. And the planet X we're searching for is Neptune's perturber, which, like Neptune, orbits our Sun. For this reason, Planet X is described in ancient wisdom texts and folklore from around the world as Marduk, Frightener, Destroyer, Herkobolus, Nibiru, and more. So is Planet X really nothing more than an internet hoax perpetrated by panic-for-profit fear-mongers as debunkers claim? Or is there more to it than that? There is. And it begins in 18th century Europe. On March 13, 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus, making it the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. Following his discovery, European astronomers turned their attention on Uranus and observed perturbations in its orbit. This discovery would eventually launch the search for Planet X. If one were to choose the father of Planet X research, it would have to be Alexis Bouvard, a French astronomer who observed the perturbation. Knowledge will help you to endure. And now, I'd like to share some of this very knowledge with you. It's something I've put a lot of work and love into because I know it will help people to make it to the backside. And that is what I'm all about. For those in preparation and planning, healthcare is always a problematic area because it is focused on the pills, potions, and supplements preppers set aside to help get themselves through a cataclysm. And it is problematic because all things physical play out. So a practical solution is what we call transition planning. So is this a December 21, 2012 solution? No. In our last video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Path Analysis, we addressed December 21, 2012 as an awareness event. It was media driven and it was successful in creating awareness. So on that regard, mission accomplished. Now, transition is the mission. Simply put, surviving the worst of times begins with surviving the best of times. So in this program, we want to introduce the core concept of transition planning. It is a four-stage survival resource rating system. Stage one is cataclysm awareness. This is when the mainstream media begins to seriously report the news to the public at large and panic buying ensues. If you're not prepared by this, with a large object in the center and a cluster of satellites in orbit around it. But what really got our attention was that they were observing a red iron dust cloud, the hallmark signature of a brown dwarf star. Then on November 1, 2012, the 00Skyview team upped the ante with a video titled Lifting the Veil. Right out the gate, they predicted a greatest eastern elongation flyby approaching from the southern skies. Not a good thing. In astronomy, a greatest eastern elongation describes an object that passes us on our side of the Sun to the left of us and inside our own orbit. In this case, this object is also rising up from our southern skies. And it's interesting to compare the ESA NASA Ulysses probe data with the 00 Skyview flyby prediction. They then presented an orbit for their object of interest, which also happens to resemble the orbit Dr. Robert S. Harrington showed in August 30, 1990 during a television interview with Zachariah Sitchin. Next, the 00 Skyview team presented a series of color-shifted variations and a wide field view. However, their last image is of a mini constellation in Aquarius, and it is similar to the mini constellation in the January 2008 disclosure video by Nibiru Shock 2012 titled 
Nibiru Planet X photos taken January 2008. So were they seen by the Cataclysm event, will search for survivors and pull together into small, self-organized groups. While most preppers set aside enough for themselves and their loved ones, as a member of a larger survival group, you'll also share with them as well. This is when the bulk of your physical supplies will be used up. Stage 4 is the backside. This will be the time years into the future when those who survive all the worst that men and nature can throw at them live to see blue skies once again. By this time, all medical supplies will have long been exhausted, and what you'll have is knowledge. Of paramount importance will be the kind of knowledge that helps you with survival wellness and developing sustainable ways of growing food and medicinal herbs. This brings us to the simple metric of our transition planning system. It's a rating system. You rate your resources, physical and knowledge, in terms of how far they'll get you through the process. Here are a few examples. The internet is a fabulous stage one resource, but it likely will not go much further than that. A fire extinguisher is a handy stage two resource. Have one on hand. And off-road bicycles will be an ideal stage three resource for getting around when there's not much left in the way of roads. And long after the internet, fire extinguishers and off-road bicycles have rusted away, knowledge will continue to endure, especially survival knowledge like Dunjun observations and orbital path analysis. We addressed December 21, 2012 as an awareness event. It was media driven and it was successful in creating awareness. So on that regard, mission accomplished. Now transition is the mission. Simply put, surviving the worst of times begins with surviving the best of times. So in this program, we want to introduce the core concept of transition planning. It is a four-stage survival resource rating system. Stage one is cataclysm awareness. This is when the mainstream media begins to seriously report the news to the public at large and panic buying ensues. If you're not prepared by this time, be ready for long lines and short supplies at the store. Stage two is cataclysm events. Simply put, the first to fall will most likely be the last to know. Planning and luck will also play equal roles. While planning and preparation is not a guarantee that you and your loved ones will survive these events, it will, however, dramatically increase your odds of survival. And with repeated events, expect all or part of your survival stores or caches to be exhausted, lost, or stolen. Stage 3 is post-event. Those who survive the cataclysm event will search for survivors and pull together into small, self-organized groups. While most preppers set aside